Hello, everyone. Today's lesson is on the hydrolysis of, a, of salts. Now, the word hydrolysis seems to imply hydro, water, lysis, split. We're looking at salts that cause water to split. When water molecules split, it can change the pH of a solution. Now, water does, on its own, ionize. But the quantities of ions produced from the self-ionization water are generally fairly small. In this case, salts will increase those quantities substantially. Now, let's take a look at what happens here. So, if we take a substance like hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, and ammonia, which is a weak base, um, they can be responsible for the acidic and basic nature of solutions by altering the concentration of hydronium ion and hydroxide ion. Sometimes, however, there are salts that on the surface do not appear to be acidic or basic, but upon further analysis, we can see that the salt ions that are created when the salt dissolves can sometimes act as proton donors or proton acceptors. Now remember, if they are proton donors, they will act as acids. And if they're proton acceptors, they will act as bases. So we will take a look at that today. So let's take an example. Uh, first, let's clearly define what a salt is. A salt is an ionic compound generally made up of um, a metal ion bonded to a non-metallic polyatomic ion or ammonium bonded to a non-metallic polyatomic ion. Now, salts in solutions will break apart, yielding charged particles. Uh, they'll yield anions and cations. Anions, and how I remember this, is the letter N in anion. The second letter tells us it's negative. A cation, see the T? T looks like a positive sign. So cations are another name for positive charged ions. So um, <clears throat> now here's an example of a salt. Sodium chloride, calcium chloride, calcium sulfate, ammonium chloride. In fact, most of the compounds we learned to name earlier in the course were in fact salts. Now in general, salts that contain an anion of a weak acid, in this case sodium cyanide, cyanide is an anion from a weak acid. What's a weak acid? Well, it's hydrocyanic acid, HCN. Now, if there is a negative ion present in a salt, the negative ion can act like a base. Sodium cyanide, the sodium ion, is a spectator ion. The positive charge is only one. It's not sufficient to uh, have an effect on water molecules. So any salt containing a cation of a weak base will form an acidic solution. In this case, Ammonium ion. Ammonium ion can act like an acid, and we'll show that in future slides. The chloride ion is a minus one ion, but again, if you memorized your seven strong acids, remember hydrochloric acid, strong acid? Well, the chloride ion, because when it's from a strong acid, the negative ion will not impact the pH. It does not cause hydrolysis of water, doesn't split water molecules apart, does not form hydroxide ions or hydronium ions. So anions, again, of strong acids and cations of strong bases react very little with water. We're gonna investigate that clearly. So here are some examples. Chloride ion is part of hydrochloric acid. Nit uh, nitrate ion is part of nitric acid. Sodium is part of sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. Calcium 2 plus is part of a strong base. They do not have an impact on pH, these ions alone, when they're parts of salts. So again, we can review the um, lecture one from this series of strong acids and bases. And recall the definition of a strong acid and base. They're, they will totally ionize in aqueous solutions. They don't form equilibria. These reactions flow to completion. 
So here are two examples here. Strong acid, hydrochloric acid, strong base, sodium hydroxide. And the strong acids you were asked to memorize include hydriotic, hydrobromic, hydrochloric, chloric, perchloric, sulfuric, and nitric. Not that difficult to remember a short list. And the strong bases come from groups one and two, hydroxides. There's sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and then calcium, strontium, barium hydroxides, respectively. Now, if you look at a periodic table, you might wonder, um, you can see that sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium are here. Calcium, barium, strontium are here. You might wonder why, for instance, lithium, beryllium, magnesium hydroxide are not part of that list. And the answer is, is that if you think of these as all ionic compounds, ionic compounds are held together by ionic bonds. And it turns out the bigger the ions, the weaker the forces, because the centers of the two ions are further apart. Uh, the electrostatic force is an inverse square force. The further apart the ions get, the weaker the force. So the bigger the ions, the weaker the force. And again, what we want to consider here for the strong bases, the weaker the force, the more easily those particles can break apart and liberate their hydroxide ions. So if you look at lithium and beryllium and magnesium hydroxides, those ions are smaller, the forces are stronger, they tend to hold on to their hydroxide ion more rigorously. Therefore, they are not strong bases because the force of attraction is too strong. They don't liberate their hydroxide easily. Now, the same thing happens if you consider the binary acids here. Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydriotic are all strong acids. Why isn't hydrofluoric a strong acid? Well, for the same reason. If you consider the ionic property here of uh, hydrofluoric acid, the fluoride ion is, is, is much smaller than the chloride ion. and um, as a result, its attractive force for hydrogen in the hydrofluoric acid formula is too strong. It does not liberate it as easily. So that since it holds onto the hydrogen more strongly, it is not considered a strong acid, but a moderately strong acid. So a little bit of a lesson here with periodic table. Again, remember as you go down the periodic table and you go down through it, the, uh, the particles get larger because you add energy levels. Both hydrogen and helium have one energy level, lithium through neon have two energy levels, sodium through argon have three energy levels. As you add energy levels, two atoms, they get larger. Now, strong acids and bases totally ionize, so the force of attraction between their ions must be fairly weak. So if we have an example here, here's a strong acid, a hydrochloric acid, and the force of attraction here is fairly weak. So what happens is water molecules, when they collide, can fairly easily pull them apart. And when they do, what happens is the pH of the solution changes because hydronium ion is formed. So now let's talk about that chloride ion. The chloride ion did have a, a fairly weak pull on that hydrogen ion to begin with and allowed it to be lost when a water molecule collided it, collided with it. But what if the chloride ion now is free to collide with another water molecule? Well, we established that that force of attraction is fairly weak. So when the chloride ion that's, that is hydrated, surrounded by water, when this collides, Typically, it, the force of attraction is too weak to remove it. So, sorry about that little uh, mistake with the screens, but that's the point I'm trying to make. Now, this is true for all anions of the strong acids, not just chloride ion. But let's recall again, here's the list of strong acids and any of the negative ions that are part of these strong acids, the same effect can be um, asserted, that they have weak pulls on hydrogens. So if any of these negative ions are part of salts, they will not have an impact on the pH. Give you some examples here, all right? So if I had sodium bromide or potassium chloride or rubidium chloride or sodium perchlorate or, um, 
calcium hydrogen sulfate or magnesium nitrate. Those are all salts that have these negative ions. But since these negative ions have fairly weak attractive forces for hydrogens, they will not re remove a hydrogen from water when they collide. And that's important to uh, solve problems involving the changes in pH when salts are added to water. So let's compare this to weak acids like methanoic acid. Methanoic acid, again, is an organic acid. It's got a, a, a C double bond O bond here and a COH here and a hydrogen. Now there's two hydrogens. The hydrogen that is bonded to the carbon is too strongly held because the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is not that great. But between the oxygen and hydrogen, the electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen is much greater. The uh, electron pair is not shared very equally. It spends much more time around the oxygen. That makes this hydrogen vulnerable. Now, because it is a weak acid, this doesn't happen that often, but in most of the collisions that happen between water molecules will have no effect. But occasionally, what happens, a water molecule, if it uh, collides at the right angle with enough force, it can actually remove a hydrogen. And you can see now that this has had an impact on the pH. So the COO minus ion that's created, okay, can now itself act like a base. So let's see how that will happen. So if I have this COO minus, formate is another name for it. This is also called formic acid. It's a substance produced by ants. Fire ants produce this substance and inflict painful bites on its victims when they inject formic acid into the cut. If you've lived down south in the United States, you would have had an encounter with them. Up here, we're lucky in Canada. Too harsh an environment for those fire ants to survive. But now, let's talk about how this substance, this formate ion or methanoate ion, can act like a base. Well, we've established that the force of attraction relatively strong. If it collides with a water molecule, it can remove the hydrogen from a water molecule. So what was a water molecule is now a hydroxide ion. So if this happens in a solution of, let's say, sodium formate or potassium formate, then the formate ion will change the pH of the solution. It will make the pH go up because of the formation of the hydroxide ion. Those negative charged ions can steal hydrogens from water. That's how they act as bases. Now, the only negative ions, again, I'll repeat myself, that don't act like bases from salts are the negative ions from those seven strong acids. So if you remember that list, you only have to know that any negative ion that is not part of that list acts like a base. Now, when they do ionize, they liberate those ions and they split water apart, as we've just talked about. So here's an example here of sodium acetate. When we look at it, it doesn't look like an acid or a base. It's got sodium to start with. Most acids we've been trained in the past start with hydrogen. But it does have a negative ion here. The negative ion is acetate. And we can write the acetate ion either this way or this way. It doesn't matter. But is that negative ion part of a strong acid? That's what you first ask yourself. And of course, if you remember the list of strong acids, acetate, hydrogen acetate or acetic acid is a weak acid. Remember, it's part of vinegar. Vinegar is a 5% solution of acetic acid. Well, since it contains a negative ion from a weak acid, it can act like a base. So, sodium acetate is a salt because it contains ions. It contains a metal and a non-metal, and that's what constitutes it as a salt. So it's easily pulled apart by water molecules. The sodium acetate, when placed in water, dissociates. Notice it's not in equilibrium. This, is a, uh, this reaction actually goes to completion. All the sodium acetate will dissolve in water, but the acetate ion that's liberated now will participate in an equilibrium 
And this equilibrium can alter the pH because, as I've shown before, the negative ions that collide with water are capable of stealing hydrogens from water. And when they do, they form HC2H3O2, acetic acid, and they create hydroxide ion in significant quantities to influence the pH. Now you might say, well, wait a minute here, we're forming a weak acid. Doesn't that lower the pH? But think about the quantities involved. Initially, these quantities are fairly small, but large enough to influence the pH. But the HC2H3O2 will also be involved in an equilibrium and create hydronium ion, but the quantity will be very, very small compared to the original amount that was there, which is the same as the original amount of the hydroxide ion that was there. So in fact, the amount of hydronium ion created by this particle after this equilibrium is established is too small to impact the pH. This hydroxide ion that was created from the initial reaction is much larger. So the sodium ion, uh, that's created from the liberation here is a positive one charge. It does not have an effect on water molecules. It does not cause a hydrolysis of water molecules. So, so all plus one ions are called spectator ions in this context. Now the solution becomes basic because the hydroxide ion quantity increases. The hydroxide ion concentration now exceeds the hydronium ion concentration. So the sodium acetate, which on the surface appeared to be a salt, is really a base. A common example of that is baking soda. Baking soda is a salt, but the, uh, the uh, ion liberated from baking soda, uh, hydrogen carbonate, acts like a base in the same way that the acetate ion and sodium acetate acts like a base. So ammonium chloride, here's another example. So ammonium chloride on the surface does not look like an acid or a base, doesn't have uh, hydrogen in it to start, it doesn't have hydroxide ion, but what can happen is when it dissolves, it forms ammonium ions and chloride ions. So the chloride ion is the spectator. Why? Because remember our rule, negative ions that come from strong acids are not capable of hydrolyzing water. They have no effect on water. So the chloride ion is a spectator. Now the ammonium ion, on the other hand, is a different story. The ammonium ion can affect water. The ammonium ion that's liberated from the dissolution of the ammonium chloride can impact the pH. How? Well, the ammonium ion can donate a, one of its hydrogens to a water molecule. And since it does that, it behaves like an acid. And by definition, we can say it's a cation of a weak base, a weak base being ammonium hydroxide. So the positive ion in that formula can act indeed like a acid by donating a proton. And let's see how this happens. So ammonium in equilibrium with water molecules can donate hydrogens, one of its hydrogens donated to water, making hydronium ion and producing ammonia, an H3. Those are all aqueous particles. So ammonium chloride can act like an acid because the liberated ammonium ion donates a proton to water and changes the concentration of hydronium ion. So to look at that effect, here we have ammonium ion, and this is a water molecule. Remember a water molecule has two unshared pairs of electrons, quite strong negative charges. If it collides with an ammonium ion at the right angle uh, with enough velocity, not too much velocity, but just the right amount of speed, what can happen is a hydrogen atom can be pulled off of the ammonium ion. And when it is pulled off, we end up with a hydronium ion and we end up with the ammonia molecule once the hydrogen has been removed. And that shows you how ammonium can act like an acid in a salt like ammonium chloride. So here's the equilibrium again, but the chloride ion, remember, because it's part of that strong acid, the force of attraction for hydrogens is too weak. It acts like a spectator. It does not influence the actual pH. So the solution, because of the impact of the ammonium ion, the solution's pH will, will start dropping, and uh, the hydronium ion 
concentration will now exceed the hydroxide ion concentration in this solution of ammonium chloride. So now let's talk about the problems that I'm, we're going to be solving here. So we have a solution of sodium acetate. On the surface, it's neither an acid nor a base initially when we look at it. It's a salt. But when this salt dissolves, it liberates its ions, in this case, sodium ion and acetate ion. Well, we've just learned that the sodium ion is a spectator because it's plus one charge. It's not sufficient to have an impact on water molecules. The acetate ion is a different story. It's a negative ion that is not part of a strong acid. So negative ions, as a rule, that are not parts of strong acids can cause changes to pH. They can act like bases. So this particular reaction goes to completion. So we started with 0.1. 0, 0, mole per liter sodium acetate. And what happens as it dissolves, all of the sodium acetate is dissolved, leaving no sodium acetate molecules present in the solution. All that will be present is an equal number of sodium ions and acetate ions. So now to uh, figure out the change in pH of the solution, we're only interested in the acetate ion. The sodium, as we've mentioned, the sodium ion has no impact on the pH. So now let's consider what happens in this equilibrium. So acting like a base, the negative ion combines with water. It removes a hydrogen from water and forms acetic acid and hydroxide ion. Now, initially, the concentration of, of acetate ion in the solution from the sodium acetate was 0 0.100 moles per liter. And it is going to lose a small amount is going to react, represented here by X. So the acetate ion concentration is going to go down by X. And then, of course, the reaction flows in left to right direction. We're going to make equal quantities of HC2H3O2 and OH1 minus. So that at equilibrium, we will have X amount of HC2H3O2, X amount of OH1 minus, and 0 0.100 minus X amount of acetate ion. However, X is probably too small to impact the 0 0.100 molar. We're going to solve for X and then look to see if we're, our assumption is correct. We do that to avoid a quadratic equation. So, so what slips, um, what most students, uh, where they make a mistake, where they slip up, is by using the Ka for this equilibrium. Well, it's important to note this is the Ka of acetic acid. This acetate ion is not an acid, it's a base. So, and we have to use the relationship between the Ka and the Kb of conjugate acid base partners. Now, the Ka for acetic acid is given, and its conjugate uh, base partner, we can calculate it. Now, we know the Ka times the Kb equals Kw for all acid-base conjugate pairs. So in this case, the conjugate acid-base partnership is, is acetic acid and acetate ion. So given the Ka, we can now solve for the Kb for the acetate ion. By rearranging this equation, we get Kb is equal to Kw divided by Ka. So if we take the Kw, 1 times 10 to the minus 14, divided by the, the Ka given for acetic acid, we end up with the Kb for acetate ion, 5.68 times 10 to the minus 10. Fairly small number. It is a weak base, remember. So now we can solve for x by using the Kb for this equilibrium for acetate ion is the concentration of, of Hc2H3O2 times concentration of OH1 minus divided by the concentration of acetate, C2H3O2, one minus. So we know the Kb, we calculated it was 5.68 times 10 to the minus 10. And now it's equal to x squared divided by 0.1. So we can cross multiply and divide and get x equals the square root of the product of the Ka and the concentration. So x is 7.54 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. And we now know if we take this number and substitute it here and solve for 
this equation, we see that 7.54 times 10 to the minus 6 is too small to impact on 0 0.100. So we also know X is the quantity of hydroxide ion at equilibrium. And to calculate the pH, we could calculate the pOH first. pOH is the minus log of the concentration of hydroxide, which is this quantity. So we can calculate it as 5.123. Now notice it's three decimal places. Why? Because the original quantity given was three significant digits. We need three decimal places because again, the whole number part of a pH or pOH does not count as a significant digit. So now, we can calculate the pH. pH is 14, take away the pOH. So the pH is 18, or sorry, 8.887 for this solution of salt. And negative ions again act like bases. That pH is above seven. It seems to be consistent with our idea about the effect of negative ions on pH from salts. So a second example. Here we have a solution of ammonium chloride, and we can calculate the pH. Now, this technique is fairly useful because armed with a pH meter alone, you can figure out the approximate concentration of a salt solution, like ammonium chloride. By knowing the pH, we know the equilibrium concentration of, in this case, the ammonium ion is going to, going to act like an acid. The chloride ion is part of a strong acid. So its force is too weak to act like a base. So positive ions can act like acids. Negative ions can act like bases. In this case, the ammonium ions can act like an acid. So the pH drops to 5.13. And this number tells us the concentration of hydronium ion at equilibrium, which we can use to find the original concentration of the salt solution here of ammonium chloride. So Ammonium chloride, again, as a salt, completely dissociates when it dissolves. It forms equal quantities of ammonium ion and chloride ion. We don't know how much that is yet because we weren't told. So we just know that at completion, we are going to have whatever concentration the ammonium chloride is, is going to be the concentration of the ammonium ion and the chloride ion. So Let's use the equilibrium expression now for the positive ion here, the ammonium ion that acts like an acid because we were given the pH, remember. So again, we don't know how much was present, but we do know from our mathematical relationships between hydronium ion and pH that the concentration of hydronium ion, 10 to the minus pH, which in this case is 10 to the minus 5.13, which is equal to 7.41 times 10 to the minus six molar. So when we go 10 to the minus 5.13, we get this value, which is the equilibrium concentration of hydronium. Now, where did the hydronium come from? It had to come from this reaction. Ammonium reacted with water to make hydronium. Well, it didn't make hydronium ion in isolation. It had to make ammonia as well. It had to make it in equal quantities. So the hydronium ion concentration went up by that amount, and so did the ammonia concentration. So those two are equal. And we know that this quantity had to go down by the same amount that it went up because this reaction went left to right. The ammonium ion must have went down by that amount. And we don't know how much was present initially. We weren't told. We were only told the pH, which is the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium. So to calculate the quantity of ammonium at equilibrium, we know it's X take away 7.41 times 10 to the minus six. Now there's a little mathematical trick to make this calculation easier to find X. Again, we're gonna assume the amount that actually uh, ionized, in this case reacted, is fairly small compared to the original amount that was there. So we're gonna assume 7.41 times 10 to the minus six is negligible compared to X. And that will allow us to solve it without using a quadratic equation. So we know the Ka, we were given uh, the Ka of ammonium ion, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. And we know that quantity will equal, at equilibrium, the concentration of NH3 times the concentration of H3O plus divided by X. So we can now solve for X 
x will be 7.41 times 10 to the minus 6 squared divided by the Ka for ammonium ion, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. So we get a value of 0 0.098. And to check, that's what x is. That's the original quantity of ammonium ion that was present. It's the original quantity of ammonium chloride that was present. So the amount of chloride ion would be the same, 0 0.098 moles per liter. And when we subtract 7.41 times 10 to the minus 6 from 0 0.098 moles per liter, you will see it is negligible. Our original assumption is correct. We avoided the quadratic equation. So now, if both of the ions from the salt influence the pH, the problem becomes a, quite a bit more difficult. And uh, typically what you do is you compare the Ka of the uh, positive ion, that's a weak acid, and the Kb of the negative ion, which can act like a base. Whichever one is larger will have the greatest influence. So you simply use that equilibrium to calculate the pH. The other one becomes negligible, the impact. So the homework for this particular lesson, again, Chemistry is not a spectator sport. No pun intended. You have to do your homework. So please practice the assigned questions from the textbook. And stopping now.